Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we talk about the future of all of us. Today we've got someone who pretty much does that for their job, Steve Sammartino on the program. Thanks for coming today, Steve. That's a pleasure. So you, you've got two robots making out in your shirt. First of all, where did oh, you get you, that you, shirt? You know, I did, I did that, have did to you? bring I did have to bring that up because it's pretty awesome. There you go. It's um I saw it in Boston. I was in Boston a couple of weeks ago and I went to this crazy sneaker store which is hidden called Bodega. And you go in there, actually it's the most interesting place to buy sneakers because you go there and it's a store. And I said to the guy, I said, is there a sneaker store here? And he said, nah, man, a lot of people think that's here. It's not here anymore. He said, but if you came all this way, I'll give you a free Snapple. And then you press a button on like a vending machine and then the door opens up and there's a secret sneaker store hidden in the back. And this was one of the T-shirts there. And I went there for sneakers and I came out with the T-shirt as well because I just think that that's really interesting. The robots sort of, that's wow, hilarious. that's interesting. That yeah. is that is hilarious. It's that it's the experiences that make uh that make the product <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it is. And I had this shirt on when I picked my daughter up from school the other day. And my wife reminds she said, What are you doing wearing that here? Because they're all you know very young. So I had to like put it on inside out. Yeah, uh, daddy's in trouble. So I hear yes. you launched I hear you launched a rocket ship made of Legos. And I want to find out what the deal is with Legos with you. Yeah, well, what's up? It wasn't me. I, I'm not I'm so I can't blame myself. I, I, um, you know, through the blogging and the writing that I did, a, a, a young uh, technology guy, self-taught physicist from Romania, sent me a request on Skype. You know what it said? The Skype request said, hi, I'm building a spaceship. That's what it said. And I'm like, okay, cool. Space is where it's at. Everyone's getting their Mars on. I'm going to get my Mars on too, except conversation with the guy. Speak to him. The first conversation, he said, uh, you know, he was from Romania. He said, look, you look rich. Um, from Australia, how about you send me twenty thousand dollars for an experimental space project? And I thought, okay, I'm just going to send a complete stranger money on the internet. That sounds like fun. That'll work out. Uh, <laughs> and then I ended up doing it with a, this this young kid. He wanted to do all these rocket projects, and that was one of the things that we did. But we didn't. It wasn't a Lego space shuttle. What we did was we used one of the old military industrial complex weather balloons from like the 70s that we bought off eBay and all this kind of stuff and put it up into actual Earth orbit and uh, into the, the the stratosphere, the near space field, about 120,000 feet and filmed it with a GoPro and a sports, a global GPS tracker and then like, you know, found it in the snow in Germany and uploaded the footage. So it was a Lego space shuttle that was hanging and being filmed by an air balloon up in space. But it was still pretty cool. That's like a Richard Branson deal. Let's do something ridiculous for marketing. But you didn't have yeah, a... Yeah, it kind of was that, right? But it was actually... The, the thing was is that we wanted wanted to see uh, how cheap it would be to put something in the near space field. Like this would have been several million dollars 20 years ago. Like just... You got to think back to, you know, what a GPS was an inaccessible thing. You know, to have a camera that could survive the near space field, it, that wasn't available. Just simple things like that that we take for granted, NASA grade technology is like under $100, just all these bits and pieces and you can hack together anything. I mean, these days we're putting small satellites, you know, you can buy a space on a rocket and get an actual satellite up there. I mean, this is what people <laughs> fail to realize. Well, tech's got some weird stuff that's happening now in the technology community with AI and social and all of that. The truth is we've still got the gift of NASA it's like we've got NASA grade technology available to everyday civilians like you and me. So that's yeah. what that project was. It's ridiculous. Smartphones have made some major improvements. There have been some problems as well, but just <laughs> democratizing that. That seems to be a theme. The, the DIY hacker movement. You seem to be, didn't you build a car out of Legos? Was that the Lego? Yeah, that, that was what we did after that. It was the same guy that I collaborated with. Um, his name's Raoul Wider. He lives in New York now. And he's a self-taught physicist. And then after that, we built a full-size drivable Lego car. And this was quite a few years ago now. This might have been six years ago. Um, 500,000 pieces. Had an engine made of Lego. Uh, all standard Lego Technic pieces. And the engine was a pneumatic engine, which means that it runs on air. And it... Um, yeah, and you could drive it about, you know, 20, a bit over 20 kilometers an hour. 
And uh, we just did that as a hacker project again, just to kind of see what we could do. And we crowdfunded it on Twitter. It was too weird for the crowdfunding websites. So, so we, we put a tweet up on Twitter and got 40 people to give us $500 each. And then we just built it just for the heck of it and then drove it around the streets of Australia. Why didn't you turn it into more of a business, this, this hacker movement? You know, a lot movement. of people ask me that. You know what? I've got like a really, really low threshold for boredom. Once I've done something, I almost don't want to do it again. And the project was just to see what's possible more than actually to go, oh, look, there's pneumatic engines in here or I could do, you know, these designs. It just, just didn't feel like it. There was a lot of pieces in it that were part of the technology future. But the thing that I really like doing is something new and for the first time and then just handing over that knowledge and just moving on to the next thing. So the space deal, someone pings you on Skype and says, I want to build a spaceship. Most yep. people are going to be like, what the hell? And when the money co part comes in, then they're going to think you're just nuts for saying yes. Why are you nuts? What's the deal? Why are you obsessed with space? You've got to be obsessed to do something like that. Well, at first, I mean, I didn't just give him the money on the first day. Like, Raoul, was a, he was a really uh, persistent person. And so the first time I'm speaking to him, I'm like, listen, you know, I can't. I can't just give you money. I don't even know you. He's like, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I know all this stuff and I've done all these projects. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. And actually I said to him one day, I said, you need to read The Art of the Start. This is this old book a lot of years ago, which is an old Guy Kawasaki book, a great, great um, bootstrappers sort of book. I said, go read that and you'll learn how to raise capital or whatever. You, if you're smart enough to build a rocket, you should be smart enough to you know, raise capital. And um, the next day he'd come back and go, I read the book. Here's my 10 point summary. He like started using it against me. And like every day I'd just speak to him a bit more. And it wasn't straight away I gave him the money. Like we developed this online relationship. <laughs> Sounds super dodgy. But you know, like where we just ping each other and exchange information. It was almost a little bit like the old um, internet relay chat, IRC kind of chat stuff, you know, where you find someone who's interested in quirky and cool stuff. And, and, uh, and that's how it came about. And uh, yeah, so it was like I didn't just do it straight away. I got to know the person first, and I thought, what's the worst that can happen? You know, you put a bit of money into it and do it, and what's the worst that can happen? Get a good pub story. Speaking of pub story, why not pitch somebody like Lego and say, hey, this, we're going to do this incredible thing. We could do this with Lego or we could do this with Tinker Toys. Actually, you know what we did? It, it, on the second project, once we'd already done it, we, we went to them we said, listen, we're going to build a full-size car out of Lego that you can actually drive. No one's done that. We're going to do it. It's going to be first. It's going to be incredible. And Lego, to their credit, they got back to us and they said, look, if we gave money to, to every person who's doing a cool Lego project, right, and anyone could go onto YouTube and just see, like, it's just so many cool Lego projects. They said, we'd be out of business tomorrow, right? They said, but what we will do is we'll give you the Lego pieces at cost price. I said, okay, that, that's a fair deal. That's a fair deal. Um, they said, show us some progress and then we'll put you into this like, you know, Lego program where you can get it at cost price. So we got everything at cost price and which was great. But then, you know, what happened when we finished the, this is a true story. So when we finished the Lego car and we drove it, right, we, um, we owed Lego, like it was like 14,000 euro at this point. And it was like, you know, like we went way over budget. <laughs> we were meant to spend like 20 grand and it was something like 65,000. I was over budget. I wasn't telling my wife how much money I was putting into it. It was crazy. And Lego were like, you know, ready to start legal action. And we had just filmed the video in early December and it was like a week before Christmas. And we showed them like the video and said, um, we owe you $14,000, but if you waive the $14,000, we'll put the video up before Christmas. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> you look at how much, the, this is what I'm thinking. They said they'd run out of money. I remember when I was younger, I don't think Legos were as expensive as they are today. They're ridiculous. I've, I've seen yeah, kids getting cheap. these presents. They seem to be going up. I mean, building is always good, but there seems to be a lot of money there now. Yeah, you know what? It seems as though there's a lot more of that packaged kind of Lego stuff. Like the hardcore people just buy like pieces. The star, like, the, like the Star Wars yeah. Conqueror, you've got the little rover or whatever, and it's all pre-built. It's all, it's, yeah, it's all kind of pre-built. Of course, you can make your own, but oh, I can remember when I was a kid, we would just basically get different size bricks, and you would just get like a pack of bricks, which you can still get, and it was up to you to make something. And you know what? I can't help but think that, well, it might teach you how things go together, 
it's a little bit formulaic. Like my daughters and my, my daughter and my son, when they get it, they get the Star Wars stuff and then and it's all follow the instructions. It's like school. It's me, like school. It's Memorize like school. it. For me, I reckon the best part of Lego is no instructions, no anything, just build. So that's kind of what I try and encourage my kids to do when we do. I'm like, don't worry about this track. Let's just make something we want to make. And not just that, but then you also have to, you also have to be creative enough to build something in your head. So not just the thing itself, but you have to have the, what's the word for it? It's the thing that adults seem to lose as they get older. They lose that creativity, that ability to make things up on the fly. Yeah, you can't, you, you, yeah, to, to, you've got to visualize it. Imagination. Then make it. Yeah, imagination. But then also, like, I think when you build it and you look at it and it's asymmetrical or something's wrong or this wasn't, then you've got to unbuild it and then rebuild it. Because I, I reckon we go through life with this really linear path where if you've been on a certain track, it's almost like you've got to stay on that track. That's the track you're on. You were studying this or you're going to do that. Or you're building that. You've got to finish it. And I reckon that's the greatest lie ever told. You don't have to finish anything. In fact, you know, the thing that I think you should do more is pull things apart and start again and, and, and leave things unfinished. Like I used to pain myself if I had bought a book that I didn't like. I would like read it until the end. And now I'm like, now I've like changed my whole view on that. It's like, dude, if I don't want to pick you up in every spare moment I've got, you don't deserve my time. You're out. This is an argument I have all the time with my wife about what movies to watch. I like right. to use IMDb to at least vet the movie and see that it's not a piece of garbage because there's so much coming out these days that you could never ever watch everything. You could never ever read everything. You might as well see that there's a, probably a good chance I'm going to like this. Yeah, exactly. I, I think so too. And, and knowing who to trust as well is really interesting. So I, I look at Rotten Tomatoes as well as that's the one that I tend to look at because I, it's kind of more aligned to my taste, I think. And sometimes I look at a certain movie and it's got a poor rating, but I can tell that that poor rating means that I will like it based on what people have said about it. So there's a real art to it. It's, it's not like, like averages, you know, 80% of people might hate this thing and the 20% that like it, that might be the 20% that I dig. So you've got to read through the comments too because sometimes, yeah, people just don't get it. Like, do you know what I mean? It's, a, it's really tricky. Yeah. So you've, you've done a lot in your career. I hear you were one of the early, I built an Uber company before Uber type Uber oh, guys. Yeah. What's the, what's the story here with Rentoid? All right. So, so here's where I get to embarrass myself in front of your audience, right? So we always look for I'm, it. Uh, yeah. So I'm not going to do the, uh, I built it before that. What I'm going to say is, is I'm the guy who was too stupid to know how to make a billion dollars. All right. So there we go. Said that I'm the, I'm the stupid guy. So I had this company called rentoid.com which was a, like a renting platform, a little bit like an eBay to rent anything, but, but items that are a little bit more expensive because renting has this, it's got a certain economic dynamic to it where the item needs to be quite expensive before the economics of renting makes sense to both the renter and the renter, you know, so, so that's how that works. But it was um, like a community-based thing. Gee, this might have been 2005 or something. Um, where people could rent things to and from each other. So ladders, lawnmowers, but yeah, bigger items as well, musical equipment, hiring equipment for events, that type of stuff. Now, here's what happened though. People started renting out their spare bedrooms for others to stay in on my platform. And I'm like, oh, it looks a bit dodgy. What if an axe murderer comes? I don't want to be liable for that. Gee, I better remove them from the platform. People were renting themselves out as drivers on it. Right. And you know how, no, no, seriously. And if you go back to the Wayback Machine, you can see it in there uh, in the rental. And I'm removing them. That's what I'm doing. That's how clever I am. I'm removing these things, worried about the illegality because I was very much from the bootstrapping world. Don't get venture capital, run your own businesses, make a profit, be independent, very indie. And, um, and so I was, there was, the market was telling me where it was about to go. And especially when the first phones came out and, and I was just too stupid to see it. And I was too worried about, that was one of the real big lessons. I was living in yesterday's world. Um, so I would take those off. I ended up selling it and getting an exit to a public company, but not, you know, a huge one. So if, that's how silly I am. If it makes you feel any better, we had an investor on uh, another podcast I run and he decided to invest in Uber and he was going to call them and 
waited till the next day and found out the next day the round had just closed. Yeah, there you go. So we've all got one of those stories. I think they're the, you know what? They're the fun things in life. Seriously, the mistakes that you make are where like the rich narrative comes from and just sort of knowing that the sun comes up the next day after you have a few stuff ups is kind of okay. But I still probably learned more than anything running that startup. Um, you know, it really put me on the path that I'm on now. Yeah, if you don't fail, you never really tried. Yeah, how, exactly. And yet at the same time, it totally sucks. How do you avoid yeah. how do you avoid doing that in the future and missing these trends that are coming through that you really need to be on board with? Because I think a lot of people would do that. Oh shoot, the risk, the the liability. Oh, I don't the government. How do you deal with something like that for yeah, people and startups? I, yeah, the thing was I see I worked in, in marketing for a long time. And in marketing, you kind of you have this factory mentality where it's like, what can we make? What are the laws? What are the regulations? What is the ingredient list on the back of the packaging? All that kind of regulation-y thing that happens with classic Procter & Gamble style marketing or PepsiCo marketing. Now, I've worked in that kind of a world. And so I used to think through the supply chain and the consequences, downside risk more than upside benefit. And I think that's one of the key things that they teach you in large corporations that is very, very different to startups. So I think there's I think there's two different business modalities that happen in life. The first one is uh, the growth mindset, and the second one is the protection mindset. When you work for a large company that's existential and it's got revenue systems, its primary objective is protect what we have. Grow, grow incrementally, but never ever risk what we have. When you have a startup, your mindset should be, do whatever it, it, it is to grow because growth equals survival. Without growth, there's no survival. I had, I think, good ideas, but I would be too worried about um, protecting the downside on a company that didn't exist yet. So I think when you're growing, you should never worry about the downside. You've got to just go for the upside. And, and that, that's the mindset, the difference between uh, a startup and big corporations and if you're transitioning from a corporation to go launch your first startup which is what many people do um i think that's the i reckon that's the number one challenge is to remove that uh de-risking mindset that happens in large corporations I, I call it the protectionist mindset protect what we have because when you work for a company your, your job is to protect the system you're a systems manager but when you're a startup you're trying to build a system a system that creates revenue. And that means that you've got to go down paths that might not work where there's risk and you've, you've just got to go for it. And you can break pretty much all of the rules and you can forget you can, to you do can things. Because, yeah, you can. Because the downside risk of breaking them, and, and the sad thing is, is that some of our largest corporations now are still behaving, you know, like they're, you know, seven guys in a dorm room or a garage is, is, is the problem is that they've got a startup mentality when they really should be thinking about their societal impacts. Uh, but, I think protecting the downside uh, makes it very, very hard for a startup to succeed. And I actually believe that's why most startups that succeed come from younger people, younger people who haven't worked from large corporations. It's not because they're better or smarter or smarter than the people that worked in um, large organizations. It's because they haven't had the indoctrination yet, which changes the mindset. It's that fork in the road and that mindset of um, managing situations versus, versus inventing revenue. I think there's also a dynamic of how hard you're willing to push yourself. I think it goes down over time after people have become a little bit more comfortable that holy shit, we only have ramen in three weeks left mentality kind of goes away when you have yeah. kids in a car and a mortgage and other things. And you're well, fine. It's the same as the company, right? So the company protects its factory, its distribution systems, its marketing, its brands, its factory, all, all of that stuff. And, and the same is true for people. You protect your house, your mortgage, your car, your holiday in Florida, all of those things that you have, your nice clothes. You, do you know what I mean? It's like it's they're the things that you protect. It's almost like the exact same thing, big corporation and person. Protect, you've built too much to protect. So, you know, if you can find a way to de-risk your life so that you can take risks again, which is, you know, what, what I did with Rentoid, I, just, I had already sort of owned my house so I could take risks when I started Rentoid. And I said, I own a house. Worst case scenario, if everything fails, I won't put the house on the line, but I can feed myself. All I need to worry about is can I get enough food and electricity? So I sort of that's when I escaped my cubicle in the corporate world. And that's what counts. Also, buying a house that's cheap enough that you can own it is very important as well. Uh, no, having, really having debt kills you. Yeah, having having debt kills you, especially, well, the, the two types of debt, right? So you've got consumer debt and investment debt. Investment debt is fine. Consumer debt is horrible. 
because consumer debt, there's, there's no upside in it. Investment debt, there could be an upside and that, that could be the thing that makes you wealthy. But consumer debt is yeah really, really tough because it just ties you into a system. And then we have the worst kind of debt, student debt, which doesn't seem to go away, <laughs> at least in the UF. Tell me yeah, about well, tell me about this pizza that you wanted to grow with your daughter. Ah, uh, so uh, well, I'm always thinking about what to teach my kids. I mean, they go to school and they learn all of the formal things and language and maths and all of those things. But what what can we teach our children? And it's increasingly hard to know what to teach them when you know all of the reports we hear is that the jobs don't exist yet. Um, actually, I've outlawed the word job in our house. That that word doesn't exist in our house. My kids know that they're never going to have a job. They will have sources of revenue, one which might include employment, but we don't talk about jobs. We just talk about revenue sources because then, you know, and the interesting thing about revenue sources is that you can think of at least 10 of those, but a job is just one revenue source. And if you use the word job, straight away you've limited your kids' thinking. So in order to open her mind, I said to her, look, why don't we grow some food? Because as you know, kids don't even understand how things get on a supermarket shelf. So I said to my daughter, why don't we um, grow some food? What do you want to grow? And she said, I want to grow pizza. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't really mean that. I really meant like food, you know, was she said, well, you know, you said food and pizza's a food. If you want to grow food, then I want to grow pizza. So I said, okay, I took her to task. I said, you really want to grow pizza? She said, yeah. I said, all right. Get ready for seven months of hard work. We're going to grow a pizza. So we grew an end-to-end -end pizza. And when I say end-to-end, -end, I mean wheat, made the cheese, built a fire in the backyard to cook it, the whole thing, planted the seeds, pulled out the weeds, all of the ingredients, everything, seven months pizza. All right? so, so we did that process and through that process, because I made her do all of the work, she owned it. She started to not just do the work but manage the supply chain and trying to make it more efficient. You know, She wanted to put in watering systems. So she's like, I'm sick of watering. I can't we put in a watering system? All oh, the birds come and eat the seeds in the morning. Can we put like a scarecrow up, a robot scarecrow? So we did that and we hacked together like a little Arduino and made like a little robot with actuated arms. I didn't even know how to do it. We just went onto YouTube and looked it up and put all the pieces together. I mean, anything you want to know today, anything, it's on YouTube. It's, it's almost like impossible to find a how-to of something not on YouTube. So we did that and through that process, she just started to understand the pieces and that go into labor to make anything in life. And you know, not just a pizza, but she started to see the world differently. Like we would go into the supermarket and she'd see all the vegetables. She's like, oh, wow, dad. I'm like, what, what? She goes, look at all this hard work. She'd see all the vegetables there because she knows how long it takes to grow tomatoes. You know, it's a six month process. And before that, she had never appreciated that. You just pick it and pay for it. And we've got money and you know, what's in that card? Just use that card thing you've got, Dad. I don't know where it comes from, the money. So she started to see labor and then she naturally wanted to improve the efficiency of her own labor by trying to put in, you know, suggesting to me automated watering systems, all of this stuff to go into making the pizza more efficient because that's what humans do. We try and we're kind of not lazy, but we want to find a better way to do something. And it's really, really hard when you're the tomato guy in the world. Because if you're the tomato guy and we can work out a way to automate what you do, you're out. But if you own the system, you don't think like that. When we own a system, we naturally want to make it more efficient. It's just what humans do. And my daughter was five or six when we did this. And she was naturally acting like some horrible industrialist. No, no not a horrible industrialist. But, you know, like it's just it's inbuilt. And pretending it's not there is foolish. Uh, and the really cool thing at the end that I really loved was at the end we had like, as you know, like just a zillion tomatoes, right? <laughs> yeah. If you've ever grown tomatoes, you, you have a lot. And she was like, we should give these tomatoes to the supermarket. And I said, well, I don't want to really give them to the supermarket they don't really give us anything. Why don't we sell them to the supermarket? And uh, all of a sudden she's like, her eyes lit up. She said, what do you mean? She's like, oh, of course, someone's growing these and then they're selling them to the supermarket. After that, she was like, you know, we should rip up the grass and start selling the you – know, look look how much they sell for. Imagine she's like doing the numbers. She's like, we could make a lot of money growing tomatoes in our backyard. We've got all this space and all this grass. Why aren't we growing tomatoes? What is wrong with you, Dad? Like she started to see the opportunity. Like that's the thing. It, it seriously has changed how she sees everything, just that one idea of growing some food. And it's ridiculous. It's it's kind of like a combination of like a Montessori unschooling approach take a take a project and solve it 
And yeah, that, that's right. so, so far off of the traditional education system. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, the thing that was cool is that I didn't say we should do this, we should do that. I just said, you want to grow a pizza? Let's grow a pizza. All of the suggestions to make it more efficient, like, you know, uh, weeding it and uh, putting in the scarecrow and the robot and the automated watering system would just hurt. She just wanted to make it better for herself. She wasn't trying to impress me or make it better for me as a teacher. Actually, you know, that's the thing. When you give people ownership and responsibility, there's something wonderful happens. You know, that it's that self-reliance thing. I, I, I think about this idea that, and this, this, it sounds horrible to say, but I just feel like a lot of people just don't take the responsibility that they need to take for their lives. Like, I don't want to sound horrible. And I know that some people have it tough and maybe it's hard for some people to learn new things. But I think that while the world's changing a lot, we've been given the dignity of choice to learn something probably for free if you've got an internet connection, pretty much anything. And I think, I truly believe deep down in my heart, if you're clever enough, to be able to learn to read and speak, then you've got all the intelligence you need to learn a new skill that is kind of a future-proof one for our new economy. So that self-reliance thing, because she owned the project, she, she had self-reliance because it was hers. It wasn't mine, it was her project. And she would just come to me with the ideas and I'd go, oh, yeah, that's cool, okay, we can do that. And I helped her on that path to what she was doing, which is kind of like, maybe how we want our bosses to behave and all too often they don't because there's that whole protection and your turf and my turf and whatever. There was something interesting in that. I think your thing you're bringing up is initiative. You find some people, you kind of have wolves and sheep, dog and sheep, and the majority of people are sheep. Unfortunately, it's just kind of, that's how the 80, 20 principle is going to play but out. Do you reckon like, but it's, this is interesting, right? Are people sheep or are people entrepreneurs who get it kicked out of them? Oh no, they're, they're, Hmm. They're wild and ravenous, like, crazy I sheep with this. until they get indoctrinated into losing that. I think yeah. you can you can kind of see how it happens. I want to say there's an age; it's like seven or ten or something, where you start to see kids start to get rid of those. They start to lose their imagination. They start to lose that recklessness. And I think I think initiative is the big thing that you're talking about. Is it's yeah. not necessarily people don't have the abilities they don't have the initiative to try something hard or even the thought process that something like that's possible or, or is it you know I, I think that and I, I also I'm wondering if it's that they have the initiative and they have the idea but they don't have the courage or they're not prepared to be embarrassed if it doesn't work out or or they, they won't do it like I think people have ideas like all day every day oh we should do this we should do that I should do that but for some reason, we don't do it. And I just wonder why. Why, why don't people just, just just do it? You know, like, why don't we do it on a weekend? You know, an hour a day. <laughs> an hour a day at night or an hour a day, you know, on a weekend. That's like a whole work week. Because let's be honest, any of us working in an office for a large corporation, we only get an hour of work done a day anyway because all of it's wasted on stupid meetings that aren't going to solve anything anyway. So imagine like that one hour a day hacking something together at night, what that can become. It's almost like a second job. And these new office, open office environments are two-thirds less productive, apparently, thanks to noise and all kinds of other things. It's uh it, it's crazy. You gotta you gotta plug in the headphones, you gotta have like the classical music or something playing, and you just ignore everyone else and get to done what you gotta get yeah. done. Yeah, exactly. What technologies are you most excited about these days? Uh, far and away, I'm most excited by blockchain because blockchain is the missing link of the internet to enable all of the things that we hope for and want going forward, including AI and uh, you know, autonomous transport and economic systems where data is protected and respected and people giving their data get fair compensation for it. That's that's the technology that I'm most excited about is probably blockchain is, is, is number one and number two is probably 3D printing and nanotech. They're the, probably the, 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 so they're my top three. Blockchain first because that is a mesh technology or a, a, a new stack or layer that can sit on top of the current internet to give us what we need and then underneath that 
uh, for me is probably 3D printing and nanotech because I think there's going to be incredible advances in, in manufacturing and health tech and all of that based on, based on the nano and the 3D printing possibilities. I like it. You probably picked three of the most controversial ones in terms of they've been very <laughs> they've been very hyped and in a lot of ways failed to deliver yet have incredible potential across. Well, that's Amara's think, law. Three. It is so Amara's, that's Amara's law. law. You know, in, in, in action and and almost everything, um, I think that is of value usually has an Amara's kind of law impact. And then there's the surprise technologies. You know, the surprise technology, I think, was a smartphone. For me, that was kind of a surprise. If you look back at the old science fiction, you know, there was devices that we use, like tricorders and these types, but it wasn't really a smartphone. It was kind of a little bit different. You know, it was laptops and TV screens that were internet connected, but that was kind of almost like a, a little bit of a fork that no one saw coming. And there'll be something that no one sees coming. There always is. Uh, yeah, but they're the three that get me really excited. So blockchain, how do you feel about... Uh, mo most of the projects to date have been either either scams or just teams that had no ability to execute raising raising yeah. a lot of money to get to get past that i think there is a ton of potential in blockchain because inherently the problem in the internet right now is how do you compensate people and how do you compensate systems correctly just the the advertising economy alone of facebook and google if you could cut that out and instead have websites paid based off of the amount of actual yeah. valuable traffic that they had from individuals that alone would change a lot of things yeah so this this is where for me it gets really interesting and and one thing that we tend to do when we look at technologies is we look at them in a linear fashion as though they're a, a vertical that lives on its own and 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 so very often for one technology to become viable it has to lend from or have other technologies that get built into it so one of the really big problems with blockchain right now is in order to get micro transactions through on a system, it's incredibly expensive and energy hungry. Uh, the proof of work process um, is, is um, it costs a lot in energy. But I think that I'm a true believer that within sort of 10 or 12 years, pretty much all energy will be free. We'll have a zero marginal cost energy environment and a zero marginal cost society where solar and other renewables and some sort of a battery curve jump will enable the electrical or energy costs associated with cryptocurrency transactions to be kind of freed up where that energy cost isn't there anymore. And some new technologies, I think, or new ways of, you know, maybe proof of stake versus proof of work and some of that stuff will enable us to have a blockchain based economy. Um, so I think that there's some other tech that isn't quite there yet that will assist blockchain to be all that it can be. Some of it will be technical solutions to the current blockchain style systems, and some of it will sit outside of the blockchain ecosystem, including renewable energy, which has zero marginal cost. So I feel like it's maybe mid eighties for blockchain. It might be another 10 years or so before it comes online but i think a lot of the other things that we expect to see we won't see until we have a system where we can compensate people with small amounts of money for digital transactions where everything's tracked and reputable which will be huge for autonomous vehicles i pay you 20 yeah it's exactly that. i mean that's car. yeah the one that comes to mind for autonomous vehicles i mean the thing that i can't understand is why anyone would think that an uber or even an Airbnb couldn't be operated where all of the people who provide supply in that ecosystem are equal owners where a small portion, a tiny portion of the transaction, you know, to rent out a car or rent out a bedroom or what have you, goes into paying a pool of developers and a digital co-op, if you like, like we used to have with the farming and the dairy co-ops or whatever. You have a group of people in the middle who run the digital side of the organization who are employed by the people who own the assets that are putting into the system because what we've got now is all of this large s where the people who are organizing the factors of production are getting an inordinate upside that maybe they don't deserve for doing something that i don't think is technically that difficult it's not the tech, it's not the technical part it's the it's the network effect so no no it is the network effect and 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 so the reason that they get to scale first is because they have the 
I'm going to say the predatory investment that venture capital can provide. Because what we've got now is reverse monopolies, where we invent a monopoly before it happens through predatory pricing through venture capital so that the incumbents can't compete. So the taxi services around the world could never compete against Uber because Uber might lose you know, 7 to $10 per ride around the world and overinvest so that they can build a monopoly by putting all of the regional taxi and ride sharing or whatever systems out of business before they can respond with the technology to compete fairly against Uber. So you have reverse predatory pricing to create the conditions where a network effect is inevitable. They and so, but, but now that they've shown us what we can do in a blockchain economy, it wouldn't take much if you can get there before autonomous vehicles come where, and even with autonomous vehicles, you could do it as well because people, people could put their own cars onto the network and send their cars to work for them like they would renting out a house where you can take their model and reverse it out so that it isn't all aggregated centrally. You could, but generally to replace an incumbent, you've got to be five to 10 X better. And just having instead five to 10% cheaper isn't, is almost never going to cut it. It's not going to no, cut no, it for consumers. Th this is I, usually you're right, but in a situation where the employees could make zero change in their behavior the barriers to switching are incredibly low you go from having this app to that app where you're a beneficiary versus them being a beneficiary it's the same behavior it's the same anything and, but the supply is one thing but the demand is the is the larger issue once you have the network effect at scale yeah yeah so like it, it it's, wouldn't it's harder but yeah. i think it's possible i think it's i think it'll happen see i'm a I, believer i, I, I would like a believer to... in blockchain <laughs> I, I would like to see it happen. I think there's other use cases that'll be more likely because there are also values for having having entities like Airbnb or Uber. It's not purely rent seeking. It's very close to purely rent seeking, but it's not it is purely... very, very close to rent seeking, if yeah. you ask me, in my view. I but, think there, you know, there's uh, a lot of worse industries though that I think Yeah, are, no, there are, are there are. And and it's not all bad, but I think that um the opportunity for a move towards a digital commons is the thing that the blockchain can facilitate. And again, it might be in industries that we, we don't expect right now and we can't even see. Just like 15 years ago, we might not have seen these industries evolve and it might be something else that we don't know yet. But, but that idea for a digital commons where the blockchain underpins a network where we all have a stake in that network and we can facilitate micro or macro transactions you know, in a trust-based society, I think that's a really, really interesting thing. And I actually think that that's kind of almost like the technology curve jump, just like Microsoft sort of got replaced by the web players a little bit because they were like desktop CD, all that kind of thing. And then you had Google with search and web and that browser sort of moment where it shifted across from the desktop to the cloud and the web. The blockchain, I think, will be that next shift. I definitely agree in some industries. I want to... I want to talk 3D printing now because 3D printing mm. is is fascinating for reasons that people don't think. If and when we do get to more ubiquitous 3D printing, what mm. happens to factories? What happens to carrier ships? What happens to all of world trade? Thing, things change, but at the same time, yeah. 3D printing's kind of been promised for a long time, and it, it's a yeah. major chicken and egg problem. Yeah, it is. Look, I, I don't think. Uh, 3D printing will change the world that much in manufacturing for things at scale. So m most of the analysis shows that anything that is produced at more than 250,000 items, it'll be better to have a reduction-based or uh, manufacturing process the, the way that we currently do things now. It'll be still more efficient. But if you can have something that's bespoke, why would you ever buy anything that's mass-produced anymore? That's the question. So if anything, something was mass produced in a few hundred thousand items, it's going to be more efficient. But on 3D printing, if you can have anything that's designed that is absolutely bespoke, I don't see why you would um, ever want to have anything that's mass designed again. So I think it's going to have a really big impact. Like already we can 3D print in more than 300 materials, uh, you know, electrical components. Organs. Uh, or, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, I can't help but think that we will eventually get it down to the nano level with 3D printing where we're literally organizing things at the, you know, almost the atomic level uh, to be able to produce pretty much anything.
And I think that this is another one of those curve jump elements where uh, machine learning and AI will facilitate a large part of that development where the thing for AI isn't really to place, replace us. The way I see AI is that it helps us do things that we can't see with other technology. That's really, for me, where AI um, should unleash itself, not to see if they can come up with better advertising campaigns than we can. That's like that's like a stupid use of AI. No, how about we use AI to work out uh, all, all of the data on cancer and oncology and come up with that or show us a better way to 3D print things down at the molecular level. That's like the job for AI. It seems as though we're on the, the wrong path a little bit now to me. For 3D printing, one of the facilitating technologies will be blockchain because you're going to have all of this digital ownership. Who's going to create right. something if they don't get paid for it? But space space will be a major driver because you can't bring shit with you to space. It's too heavy. You can that's bring a 3D right, printer, right. though, and then you can you, print a colony. Print it. Yeah, no, exactly. You, and that's the whole thing. And, um, you know, the idea of being able to get something that's bespoke or designed, I think it's, um, if you have that blockchain element on there, that idea that I can become you know, a digital craftsperson again, where my digital elements and I can sell that around the world, it's pretty much like we see on the screen right now, where you have some creative people that repurpose bits and pieces and, you know, the meme economy and all of that stuff that we do in a digital way that sits on the screen with video and all that kind of input. I feel like we're going to get to that that physical world, you know, that, that ability where we can turn bits into atoms and that'll become a new kind of micro economy as well. But it'll, it'll have a big impact I think also on uh, distribution, uh, it'd be very good for the environment. There'll be less wastage. I mean, the wastage that goes into manufacturing is inordinate. And so all of those flow on effects that uh, the bad stuff that happens with manufacturing, a lot of that stuff will go away. A lot of the bad stuff that happens with a lot of things. I could see realistically cities becoming much more self-sustaining, having their own crypto type economies where they have a, a common of uh, a goods of the commons type cars and housing and, uh, farming, 3D printing, you could kind of start to localize things and get rid of most of the emissions and most of the inefficiencies. The question yeah. is, will we do it? You know what? It, what the word that you said there is really interesting is this push to um, localization. Like one of the things that caused globalization in the industrial economy was the benefits of trade are that, you know, you make, you make bananas and these guys make peanuts and then, you know, we put them together, you have peanuts, you have bananas, we're both better off. You know, that's the idea of trade. But in a world where the technology is so diffused that anyone can make anything, you can grow bananas in a greenhouse that's solar powered and have them right there and not have to ship them around the world. Or, you know, from that to uh, being able to manufacture anything with 3D printing, it makes me wonder whether or not we're going to see a renationalization within economies. And we're starting to see that with some of the digital stuff right now. So you've got China as a very closed economy. Uh, India is looking at closing up their economy. Russia, Russia even speaking about developing their own internet that they can switch off. So it's not just the extreme left and right where we're having this nationalization for fear of jobs and all that type of thing and jingoism. But it does seem as though with enough technology, we'll be able to create anything anywhere uh, whether or not it's growing food that isn't normally available or 3d printing something that normally would need to be manufactured in a low-cost labor market like china it does make one wonder whether or not you will have these localized economies and there might be a flow back the other way the other way to a non-global environment uh, going forward based on the ability of technology to enable things in countries where they normally haven't had a relative advantage to go back. Well, there's that on a country basis, but then there's what more what I was thinking on the city basis. I think yeah. country, I think countries are a thing of the past that should start to to change radically because the the system just doesn't fit the world today. Yeah, well, it, it seems like that, but I think it might be going back the other way. I think I think it is. I think it is right now, but I think that's a backlash. Yeah, well. I think what, why it's going back right now is for socio-political reasons. But I actually think if we have enough technology, there might not be the need for trade in the way that there is now. But trade's not necessarily the driving force of countries. That's more military and finance, potentially. Yeah, maybe, maybe.
because there's really there's really three things that governments are supposed to be responsible for military or protection which and today pretty much means holding a gun to your head so you can't leave finance or <laughs> finance or economy which blockchain wants to disrupt and doesn't seem to at least currently have any potential yeah. ability to do and I don't then, think it will because it could yeah the government is sovereign and they'll just say yeah we're out lowering, lowering blockchain i mean one of the things that the crypto evangelist says the government can't own or control it well they don't own and control the poppy seed either but they've still outlawed heroin unless of course you buy it off them in an opioid sort of little packaged fashion which is mm -hmm. fine as long as you don't buy the drugs off the street it's okay as long as you buy them off the pharmaceutical companies well you could think about it in an even different manner it's um augmented reality was nothing until apple introduced augmented reality into the new iphone and suddenly that was the most popular augmented reality device in the world <laughs> if the u.s yes. government wanted to say okay guys we have a u.s government crypto dollar that's suddenly the most popular cryptocurrency in the world and right. all of the rest of them will die unless they're libertarians that want to be hiding out I, look for me i i wouldn't be surprised if every current if every country in the world launches a crypto so you you could have usc and usd where the USC is just pegged at the same price as the USD. I don't see why a government wouldn't do that to enable a blockchain economy to happen. Of course, the libertarian element of cryptocurrency will be lost, but um, they could, like you say, turn that switch on and do it. But I, And I think the benefits and the upsides would be inordinate. And I, I don't know why they wouldn't do that. And um, the idea of not having a sovereign government is the type of thing that you hear in places where they know they've already got an army protecting them. It's sort of weird that you you only ever hear that in places where everything's cool. privileged. You know, you yeah, yeah, privileged economies. You, you you tend not to hear it somewhere else where you don't have that level of privilege. I, I think they would eventually just. I mean, they'll just get rid of the paper dollars. They would just go directly to the one thing they can track much more easily than anything else. Exactly, which would be the U.S. crypto dollar. Exactly. Yes. What technologies are you most worried about, and why? I'm pretty worried about AI. And, and that's not because I think that there will be a singularity and AI will become sentient necessarily, but I feel like we're playing with fire and we don't really know. And so if you don't know something, we should be more prudent. So AI is the one that, that, that I worry about in the long run. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit with um, Hawking and Musk and these guys who worry, and I, and I do oscillate a little bit. So every now and again, I'll be like, oh, no, don't worry about it. And then I'll go through a worrying phase for two weeks. I'm in a worry phase at the moment with AI, uh, where I think that the risk of developing something that could overtake us um, is real. And, and it doesn't ne necessarily need to be sentient to do that. That's, that's the thing is that we feel like it needs to develop this life force. And a lot of people say, well, it won't be like a human. It won't know that it exists or actually it uh, won't... Um, be a true life form well that doesn't matter it doesn't have to be a true life form to uh want to extinguish anything that gets in its way so i worry a little bit about that but in the more immediate term i worry about social and i worry about social media because i think that algorithms are a really dangerous thing because they've got so much bias built into them and i really think that um it's kind of there's so many negatives associated with an algorithm and they're unregulated. It's a little bit like we're buying boxes of cereal that could have, that could be laced with who knows what, you know, heroin or whatever, and we're just eating it and we don't know and we're addicted to it. And it's, it's, it's a little bit like Coca-Cola when it had cocaine in it and there was, there, was, there was no packaging. There was no, people forget, 100 years ago, you could sell anything in packaged goods with no regulation and no one had an FDA regulation of what the ingredients were. There was no nutrition panel. There was none of that. We had to fight for it. And I'm really worried about social and the algorithm economy where we're being shaped and our breadth of exposure to the world is becoming thinner and thinner with filter bubbles and we're being manipulated in a way where the consequences I don't think have been fully felt yet. I would agree with that. I don't think the algorithms per se is biased. I think the problem is when you take a subset of people's interests or social network or their network, those people and those things are inherently biased. And if you are amplifying the things that are interesting to those things, then suddenly you create something that is inherently biased, just similar no, to the way the algorithm is biased. No, that's why the algorithm is biased because the things that you already think and believe, it keeps showing you more and more of that because that's what the algorithm does. 
I think with semantics, we're saying the same thing in a different way. But yeah, basically what it does is it, 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 it thins up your world and the things that enrage you. I mean, yeah, what gets you back? Rage, <laughs> what get, yeah, emotion, worry, fear, all of those negative psychological elements uh, are what gets you back. There's, we've lost serendipity. You know, we've lost the ability to have political discourse without people either being enraged or, you know, virtue signaling. So we get these weird extremities happening. And, and I think that's probably a large part of what's happening, you know, economically and politically at the moment with these you know, extreme left and extreme right is because everything we're being fed, the diet we're being fed informationally is being driven by this. It's not a mere coincidence that extreme political views have come about in an environment where the views and the things, your proclivity to be a little bit you're leaning towards this way just gets pushed, pushed more and more to the extreme based on what you see. Because my news and your news are really different, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, Based on what we serve. And even and even when you try and make an effort to log out, it's still chasing you. It's like I go into Google, is this you, Steve? Yes, you know it's me. I'm trying to log out. Just leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's incredibly creepy. Or just looking at your pictures and seeing, oh, these have all been organized for me. Looking at your email, do you want to add this to your calendar? Already having it added to your calendar. Yeah, your phone rings and it says, Hey, this could be this could be Joe. This could be Matt. It's like, yeah, it is. And I know that you know, and you've just got like it's that serendipity is lost. I think that's a really horrible thing. I I I, I think personally that algorithms should either be regulated or uh, they should be exposed to what they are, and we should all have the option to opt out of algorithms. Do you think and people opt out though? Because their experience will be worse. They'll go to Netflix and suddenly half the movies they see will kind of suck compared to the ones they're seeing. Out. No, you can opt out. It needs to tell you what's in them and the information that's there and how it aggregates it. We need to give people a choice because the problem right now is that it's opaque. We don't know what's in it. We don't know what the choice is. The algorithms are a secret. And Coca-Cola used to say their formula was a secret too. Yeah, you know, a lot of these and cornflakes used to say you were not allowed to tell you how much salt's in there because that's a secret. <laughs> and so we've we've heard these arguments before and for some reason because they're young nice kids with hoodies we let them get away with it it's like it doesn't it doesn't add up i'll agree with that it definitely doesn't add up it's so hard to stop though yeah well we need some people with courage we need and some people with need intelligence to, did you see them yeah, well you need you need intelligence you need courage and and then if you've got a bit of both of those then you need to help the people standing next to you and take them and move them up the learning curve yeah that's what we need to do like to have that conversation have that have that dialogue with people so that they understand i mean people didn't understand that fat free was full of sugar in the 1970s well i'm eating this fat free yogurt and I can't understand why I'm putting on so many kilos. That's because 80% of it is sugar. We took the fat out and put the sugar in to keep you happy and keep a smile on your face. And now you're having three tubs because you're addicted to the sugar. I mean, it's, it's the same thing that we've seen with the fast-moving consumer goods of food, the PCG, packaged consumer goods. It's the same thing again, just with information. And they're polluting everything. That's that's certainly certain. We have a we have a nice landfill building up with uh with Mister Toupe on top. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they're polluting everything, and they're they're polluting our minds, and, and they're polluting our ability to think. And you know, in some ways, you maybe the idea of free speech. Let's say I follow you on Twitter, and you follow me, and I want to see certain things, and I'm interested in the type of podcast you have because that's the kind of stuff that I like. Someone Jack Dorsey decides that. I didn't press enough likes when you, I looked at your stuff, but maybe I didn't like it or retweet it. And he thinks, oh, I'm not that engaged with you. And so it doesn't show me in the future the things that you write. Well, he's kind of blocked out your free speech. I signed up to listen to you, but Jack Dorsey decided because I didn't click on what you did or like it enough or do any of that or retweet it or comment that maybe I'm not interested in what you do. Just, just made an implicit assumption and then just shut you out. The conversation between you and me, that got shut out. That's, in my view, that's, that's removing free speech. I signed up to hear what you say. I clicked on you. I want to follow you. But if I don't click on enough of your stuff, it won't appear in my feed. But it's impossible. It's impossible to solve the problem then. Well, I don't think it's impossible to solve the problem. If there's too many people in your feed, then, then you would curate that just the same way you do in, in normal life. Like, see, the online world should be the same as the physical world. But for some reason, we treat it differently. Like in the real world, you know, most of us, you've heard of the Dunbar's number idea on how many friends we have, right? So 
on Facebook or Twitter, you would purge. There's only so many voices you can listen to at any one point in time. You have some family, some friends, some people whose ideas you're interested in, and you would have all that in there. And if when it's too many, you wouldn't be able to follow it all, and you would unfollow some, just like in real life. You know, you liked Mary and Tony when you joined that new company, but after a while it got too hard to call Mary or catch up and you just fell out of each other's lives. Well, that would be the way that we would do that as well here. We just wouldn't follow their stuff. So this idea that someone regulates the conversation for us and decides who we get to listen to and why, I don't like that. Uh, I think that's I think it's a real misuse of the technology and it's an abuse of power of those who develop the network systems. And in some ways, to me, it points to these companies now sort of verging on public infrastructure, like a telephone system or a road um, that's sitting on top of the industrial infrastructure. And that's probably why it sort of needs to be regulated. Mm -hmm. They're terrified of that happening. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, they're not fans of it. <laughs> yeah, not not fans at all. It's uh, We'll see. We'll see if we can get any of them on the program. Uh, we'll hold our breath for that <laughs> one. Keep trying. Keep trying. Yeah. This has been uh, this has been super fun, Steve. What is one thing you'd want to leave people with? A quote, a call to action. It can be anything before we tell them a little more about you and where to find you. Uh, look, the one thing is you've got to invest in yourself. Like right now, there's a whole lot of things going on. I mean, we touched on a zillion topics today and we barely like scratched the surface. It's There's a lot to learn, but never ever before in the history of humanity has there ever been this much choice to learn it. It's like, it's right there. Like you can learn anything, become an expert real quick. So I would just say this one thing, you got to invest in yourself because right now there's a lot of people out there with objectives that really shouldn't be, they shouldn't, they're not serving you. They're serving themselves. So you need to invest in yourself because I don't think we can rely on the people in power to have our best concerns in their heart. So invest in yourself. It's all there if you look. That's very good advice. I think a better a better way of saying it would just be they don't care. Not we can't rely on them. But that's a that's, <laughs> they, a, that's they, another they, story. Yes. Yeah, they don't care about you, so you better care about yourself, people. You heard it here first. <laughs> Pick them up by the boots, by the bootstraps. Pick yourself up, that's right? That's it. That's it. Own it. Steve, where's the best place for people to find you online? So stevesamatino.com. I write a blog once a week. You can sign up to that and Twitter. You can get me on Twitter, at Samatino, my last name. And LinkedIn is another good place to find me. Not so much on the Facebook services. Boo, Facebook, boo, Mark Zuckerberg. He's not a fan. He's not a fan, but that's okay. Neither not are a we. Fan. Hey, you got to tell the truth. Someone has to. Someone has to. We don't uh, We don't track you. We don't sell your ads data. Don't worry. It's all good. <laughs> Guys, thanks for tuning in. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. This has been a fun one. And Steve, thanks for doing this. It's been a pleasure. It's no been worries. a blast. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Cheers. mate. Cheers, guys. Yeah.